Hi, everybody. Welcome by another episode of Follow Your Passion. This time, I'm talking to David Leon Alliance. He's teaching leadership and law enforcement. Two years ago, he retired after 28 years being a, a police officer and his last role as a commander in a six, 600 plus sworn member department in Lexington, Kentucky. Currently, he's an instructor with a nonprofit organization called FBI LIDA, which stands for Law Enforcement Executive Development Association. And he teaches leadership at supervisor, command, and executive levels across the whole country. Please welcome David. How are you doing, David? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Erwin. Yeah, well, thank you for, for being my guest uh, today. So how did you come to decide to teach leadership and law enforcement, uh, David? Well, as, as you said, I recently completed a, a wonderful 28 career, uh, 28 years in career in, in law enforcement uh, in, an, in, a, in a career I loved, in an industry that I loved. And during that time, as I moved through my career toward that 28 years, and like you said, my last five years was on the command staff as a, a commander with the department, leadership early on started to really talk to me about the importance of it in that industry and in every industry, no matter where we work. And as uh, I started to develop and sharpen my saw over the years, as I started to get promoted formally and got more responsibilities with larger amounts of people or different varying amounts of people in that 28 years though, in law enforcement, as much as I absolutely loved it, if I could turn back the clock and change one thing, it would be the leadership in some instances, not many in some instances I dealt with. Universally across the board in law enforcement, one of the largest complaints that you'll ever hear will be failed or inappropriate or improper, uh, unheart driven leadership is usually the killer. Yeah, a lot of people, when they meet a police officer, they, they always talk about, oh, aren't you afraid of this and that and the bad guy and, and things happening? And you know what they'll usually tell you? No, I, I worry when I go back to the office. And because, <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's true. And so my thing was, is that I remember when I was in it and I worked for a very progressive professional agency. And fortunately, as the years went on, the leadership quality improved dramatically and it, it's in really good shape now. But in my career, in it, the times that I wasn't crazy about being there, it was always revolving around the fact that I worked for somebody that didn't have their heart in it or, or uh, was actually cruel or uh, played old school games. And uh, so my whole thing is, is that, uh, is that we just don't need that and we can do better. Uh, and that's just not in law enforcement. I know most people that work in any kind of a business environment at least go through a stage where they have someone in a, in a, and I'm going to air quote it, leadership position. It really just isn't a leader. And, and, yeah. that, and that's sad because you, you'll never get the things out of your followers that you'll get. Now, nor will you just get the satisfaction of having relationships with people that are actually truly enjoyable and everybody winning when they approach a task. So yeah. I think that's, that's where I got into it. And, and uh, it, that, it be, I'm passionate about it. I'm almost evangelical about it. Uh, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and people sense that when I speak to them. It, the idea being is that we, we as an industry can do better for sure. Yeah. And it, 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 it shows, you know, that even after your retirement, you, you're so involved with leadership and the law enforcement. That's, that's, I know it's important to you. Would you, would you say that if you're looking at leadership within the law enforcement, that most people are chosen for the capabilities or are they just promoted, uh, started from the, the streets and promote it over and over again until they become this this officer or this commander. You, I, th I think that's the the hard law enforcement in the United States is going through a a, a period of change. Where nobody's blind to that. It mm -hmm. it's a painful period of change, right? And uh, we're we're all aware of that. And one of the things that that the public doesn't see when they when they talk about change are these internal dynamics that I'm passionate about because. You made a really good point, Erwin, is unfortunately in a lot of police cultures, the, the people that are promoted aren't necessarily promoted because of leadership capability. Uh, for example, in, in many departments uh, such as mine, the promotion pro process for sergeant and lieutenant is a written test, an assessment center, and an oral interview board. 
and there's a matrix of scoring and we have a collective bargaining contract that makes sure that things are scored correctly. All of that's fine and well. And, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't dive anything anywhere near who that individual is. Uh, and I've seen different chiefs do it different ways and, and some do it better than not. And, uh, but what happens is, for example, if I take a sergeant's test, and when it's done, there'll be a list of 30 people, one through 30, based on their final scores for two years, that as promotions come available, the chief, he or she will go to that list and, and take people. In theory, they take the first three and they make an evaluation and they pick the best of those three. And I think that's where it goes wrong, because in some cultures, if you bypass number one and two to go to number three because you believe in them more, the culture goes insane because everybody feels entitled to, to knock those numbers out in order. So you see where the problem starts right there. Yeah. And then uh, in my organization and like in other ones, when you get to command level or executive level, those are in most cases, in some cases, in my case it was, are appointed by the chief of police. So there's no process unless they have an interview and a paper process and some of them do that. But that's where they make a personal decision on who they think you are, how much they trust you to bring you into their staff. Now, that can go well or that can go bad. A, a chief can do that simply based on, on trust levels, but a good chief will look over and, and watch somebody through their career, career and watch their experience as to are they demonstrating leadership skills. And yeah. so you made a great point. I, yeah. I'm not so sure in our industry that we always – move people into those formal positions for all the right reasons. Yeah. It's, it just, it, it, I just got a, a metaphor about uh, uh, soccer players. You know, you can be a great soccer player, but it yeah. doesn't make you a coach when you retire as a soccer player. Right. It, exactly. Yeah. It, uh, and you know, not, a, I don't believe any axiom that born leaders are born or leaders are born leaders. I think that people have an inclination, but there's so many things that I think you have to be on board to have uh, in my opinion, and, and of course, it, I, I'm, I continue on my leadership journey outside of the agency because we're never done. It's like anything else in life. We're, we're always learning. We're always evolving. But you have to you have to care about people. And in policing cultures, one of the problems that it's faced over it's since it began in the middle of the 19th century is it never has really been about caring people and trust me it never and and that's what the public doesn't see is is that a lot of ego a lot of narcissism steps into place and that erodes an agency from within and uh, there's there's your morale issues but you're right just because and we always say that you can have all the brass on your collar in the world and you'll be whatever that brass says you are but you are not a leader until you have followers and the followers follow you and that's that's the magic in this. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I heard one one of my coaches ever said that uh, if you want to change a company or have something uh, implemented new, you know, in a company, you shouldn't look for the the managers within the company, but you should look for the people that the other colleagues go to for for advice, and because they, those are the the hidden leaders within the company. Amen. Yes. In, in policing, we call them informal leaders. And yeah. you have people who will never take a promotional test, but they lead so well inside their environment that wherever they go, they can actually outlast poor leadership with a group of people, and which is crazy and shouldn't be that way. But you make, you make a good point because, you know, there's stark differences between management and leadership, and both are valuable and have purposes. And, you know, a basic definition you hear that I go along with is that Management is getting things done through processes. That's good. Yeah. Leadership is getting things done to the people that perform those processes. That takes it from, from the, the minimal line or the line of completion to this new level of highly motivated, creative, communicative people. But a leader has to turn all that on and uh, sow that garden and till it and make that work. But you're right. It, one of the things that, that in policing that a, a, a better executive will do is actually get to know people well enough or have people close enough to know them to to where we don't pick people simply because they're friends or they agree with this but because they watch them with other people and watch those dynamics and relationships perfect point perfect yeah point. I, I think you also made a very 
great distinction between managers and leaders, right? right. Managers are there to, to make sure that processes work and stuff. And leaders make the, the, the people that have has to work with the processes do our job as well as they, they can. As well as they can. And hey, here's a crazy concept in the United States. Maybe they enjoy it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I mean, what, what a freaky thing. You know, when I, when I teach, when I teach, I always, always, you know, I do a, a module, for example, in one of my curriculums on team building, which I love doing. And yeah. we talk about the benefits of teams and we go through the business acumen and everything because that's where we, we get our uh, FBI leader has a, a fantastic curriculum director, Dr. Uh, Neil Moore. And, and a lot of our material comes uh, not from police magazines and publications, but from Harvard Business Review and, 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 and things like that, that that matter. But getting me back to my point when I talk about well, what are the benefits of having teams? Well, if you look in the dictionary, it's like to be effective and efficient and everything. And I always look around the room and say, what about having fun, right? I mean, when we're talking about morale and motivation, fun is a word and it's a valid word. Yeah. And a, 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 a good leader that is, that is working with that, that group of people or that individual makes the job enjoyable. And when the job's enjoyable, things get done so much better and people's hearts get in it and cause it, it, it rolls out. And then the public sees it in, in public service, right? Yeah, they yeah, see yeah. It in customer. It moves from public service to really customer service. And, and you end up, you end up meeting people who actually just, you can tell that they love their job enough that they love you. And, and that, that's, that's it. But you know, management is a, is a, is a thing. And, and I never, I'll, I'm always careful because I never want somebody to think, well, he says I'm a manager. I'm bad. No, you know, it, it's vital. It, but what I always, what I think the goal is for somebody in that role is to move is to, is to manage with leadership skills. Exactly. Is don't lose the process capability. Uh, you and I talked in a pre-interview that I got excited when you said you were a process type of guy and, and, and I am too. It don't lose any of that. The trick is, is can I be enough of a leader to bring people into things like change, right? Yep. And a good leader can bring change. Uh, some people can't bring change, if you know, and, and that's one of the many values of actual good leadership is, is the ability to accept change themselves and to deliver change for an organization. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect work. Um, what's very interesting is this nonprofit organization you're currently working for. It's called FBI LIDA. You know, right. the Law Enforcement Executive Development Association. But right. the FBI part is not associated with the FBI itself, is it? But the processes no, are uh, similar? or how? Yeah, I always, oh, we, we're really quick to tell people that we are not the FBI. You yeah. know, it, but with the, the history, it leads to where that's at, is the FBI LIDA program was actually started somewhere in the neighborhood of 1991. And, and what it was is people who had been educated through things like the FBI National Academy. I, I completed session 267 in 2017, which was a phenomenal experience in Quantico, Virginia. But people who had completed that. And then there's another leadership program the FBI has hosted since I'm going to go back and say maybe the 50s called LEADS. Some of those people got together with a special agent, right? So it, it had the, the, the blessing of the FBI and forwarded and, and excuse me, excuse me, formed FBI leader. And so there, there is where we get that. So by the grace of that, we, we do get to carry their name because of the, uh, the structural connection in its formation. Uh, I didn't attend this year, but we just completed our FBI leader conference in Phoenix, Arizona this week. And for example, the FBI's executive director, uh, the big one, actually spoke at the, at that conference. So the connection is firm and, and stays there. It, it's one of those things that, that adds to our credibility and maintains our obligation to res be responsible, to be able to be associated with an organization like the FBI. Yeah. So, and the whole goal is, is, uh, leadership training. There's tons of it out there and some's really good. It's, I've been to some of the best myself. Some of it probably is just put in a carpet bag and sold to people. <laughs> but in law enforcement, law enforcement runs on tight budgets. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. That's why they can't understand why the police just can't do everything all at once. But yeah, it's yeah. a business and it runs on a tight budget. And so training outside of required service hours and things like that can be very expensive. And especially if you have to, A, send somebody far away, there's a cost, and B, 
if you send them away for an amount of time, now you, you're having a financial cost and the opportunity cost of losing a body on the ground. And that's tough. So what FBI leader does and what I love is that when you talk about doing the United States, we travel all over the country. But if you ever looked at our schedule, the names of the cities, you probably wouldn't recognize it. So, for example, in, um, in a week and a half, I'm going to uh, go back out on the road and I'm going to Victoria, Texas. Well, I'll fly into Corpus Christi. I could have flown into Houston or San Antonio. But here's what I really love about what we do is we go to areas that are a little more remote and draw people regionally to that location, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. so that the, the cost is minimized for those the people, the agencies, or the individuals that pay themselves so they have a, a really reasonable tuition for the week they spend with us. They In a lot of cases, they have zero travel expenses, right? is maybe a, a per diem for lunch, but a lot of times they're commuting. And if they do commute, if they do come from a few hours away, then they're, they're not, they're not flying across the country in, in everything. And so I think that's what I love about the organization. One of the many things I love about it is we come to you and we, we save you money and we, we give what I'm going to brag and say is, is the best leadership uh, experience training that, that is out there right now. I'll, I'll brag on that. It, uh, yeah. it, it not, not because I, I do it, but because of the people that I work with and, and because of the resonance I get back from the students by the end of the week on, you can watch them come in on a Monday and they may be at any given level of motivation. And when they leave on Friday, they will tell you in writing on your evaluation a lot of times that I am excited to get back to work Monday because I'm going to start turning these things on. But so that that's lead in a nutshell is it's an extension of all that training that's brought to the organizations in yeah. areas that that would go that are in a drought land other than that, you know, because usually it's in the big MSA, the metropolitan service area, and yeah. you have to work your way into that. So nice. Nice. It's it's wonderful to hear you talk about it and, and I can feel the passion about it. Yeah. So do you have any any amazing stories to share about how you transformed a department or ju just an office or a commander that maybe became a close friend of you or whatever? Yeah, I, I'll tell you, in my experience and, and now when you share these experiences with people that, that are passionate about it and believe in, in its role is I don't, I don't think any one person can transforms an organization, right? It, However, they, they steer the organization and make the path for that transformation to come. But for a leader, uh, it, it's their, this leader followership relationship is actually rather personal and intimate if you're doing it right. Yeah. Um, and so the, the stories that I have that, that, uh, that I love are the ones that during my career, that if I could get past, we always say, get past the hardware. If I could get past the gold oak leaves, which in police culture terrifies everybody. You could, you can work with a, a man or a woman, uh, Irwin for years out on patrol. And when you start to promote your relationship with them will change because the culture demands a change because you became the man. Right. Yeah. And, and so, but if you can get past all of that, for me, the, the wins were the people that I had that I worked with that were thinking about ending their career because of poor leadership, quite frankly, that they had been exposed to, the lack of trust they had, the, the morale that, and, the, and the motivation that circled the drain and everything. For me, it was when I could get with one of those people and bring them back to life and, and get them in that environment and move forward and to do great things. And uh, that, that takes a lot of patience, but that is that's like if i'm a, a cobbler that's having the shoe on the horn and i'm putting the tax in and and is is it always 100 percent on no and does it always work no sometimes the people are harder to work with so the the wins i had were remotivating people and making people feel valued and being there for them and then probably the ultimate win in my business is uh, if you can help somebody that is, uh, that is emotionally falling apart. And that's, they, they get into a very dangerous, a dangerous position with that, with the PTSD that they suffer, whatever yeah. it is in their personal life. And, um, uh, that, that I have some, some, some instances of that where 
that spoke to me and will speak to me the rest of my life. That if you built that relationship with them to, for enough trust and they came to you when it was really dark, um, and then that if you guided them on a path to get into a better position, wow. I mean, and again, you, you can't do that unless you take all these leadership precepts to heart and live them and breathe them and, and, yeah. and exhibit them. Um, uh, inside the agency, you know, there were some more technical things. I remember years ago is that uh, uh, I was handed the computer unit as a young sergeant from a, an excellent sergeant that uh, is, continues to be a mentor to me now, and he's long gone from the agency. But uh, I got I enjoyed that that stint because we actually uh, moved technology into the patrol cars, which was a new thing for us, and that was a, a very exciting thing to do to handle multi million dollar budgets and. And you talk about bringing change to an organization, you bring laptop computers into police cars in the late nineties with an older police force that just some people had never had a, held a mouse in their hand. And, yeah. uh, and we, and we quickly moved to that to coming off of paper reporting. Hallelujah. Finally, you know, we, <laughs> we, we, uh, we really got more environmentally friendly and super efficient. So big change ticket items that I was blessed to have a part on and lead on was, was things like that. Mm -hmm. But again, I, that the point I've got to make, you had to really be a leader to, to get change to happen. And I think that was like, that was my, uh, my sawmill where I, where I really learned this and learned to look at motivators and learned it at how to move groups of people, then larger amounts of people. And, uh, exciting stories on on that side too about how do you how do you work through a culture that is likely going to be very resistant and not yeah. adaptable to this change and large parts of it weren't but we did it by being patient with people by understanding those walls yeah. and instead of going to them and putting your collar pins on and saying you're going to use this because i'm a sergeant and i told you to is i'm going to make this so attractive to you that you're going to not want to use it and that that was a, a proving ground for me to be able to say, trust the process that this leadership really works if, if we apply ourselves, even if we're not perfect, if we're applying ourselves, it works. Yeah, nice. So, yeah. Nice. And I, I love the fact what you said, you know, about about getting those those individuals re-motivated because oh, if yeah. they would leave the company because of uh, bad leadership, you know, you can lose a very valuable person. Yes, and if you can remotivate them, then then you you keep them uh, within within the force, and that's great, of course. The, the hot the hot button uh, soundbite these days that should stay forever is people don't leave bad organizations; they leave bad leadership, and that's true. And now you can have an organization that is infested with with leadership that's poor, and that can happen in a police department. Is you can have just this this whole thing where the the cultural expectation is that the leaderships just be, just be mean that I'm going to get everything done by autocratic decision-making strong will top down driven. And, and I've always said, you will get your job done hands down, especially in policing because they're going to follow orders. Correct. It's paramilitary, yeah. but you'll never get, you'll never get a new level and you'll never get real satisfaction. So you're, you're right. And, and what gets me is in policing that if, if we, uh, recruit people if we if we research them if we feel comfortable with them and we bring them on board there's a, a a time and expense costly process of training that person and refining that training and finalizing that training and then working with them so that every day is a training day after that we invest a whole lot in an individual and more than most of corporate america i can promise you that financially and time wise if you do that and you end up with what I would call an ideal officer. The only thing out there that will really run them off is an unideal leader. And if you work in an organization, I was in a fairly good size organization. In an organization like that, you can run away from that leader sometimes. You can bid out or transfer out or get a new assignment and move it. But it was always my curse that that, that bad leader would follow you somehow. And and. If a person doesn't feel like they can move or they can't move in that moment, and that's a daily thing, they, they'll be driven out because it, it'll take their why away from them. When your why turns from, I really want to do this job because I love my community and I want to serve my community. If your why shifts from that to, 
I'm at this job because I can't retire for 18 years, four months and 36 days and four hours. And, you know, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. They're not happy. And uh, can you blame them for going somewhere else? And, and, and it gets deeper than that, that when they have issues or is somebody truly approachable or, or, or they can somebody, do you, do you have a leader that'll look at it, listen to you very intently and, and actively and then sit down with you and say, let's fix this. You tell me what you need from me. And that's what leadership is. And um, as, as a matter of fact, I heard a quote last night from a deputy coroner that I'm stealing from her and I'm going to use it. I steal things from my students all the time. <laughs> but she was talking about the, the, the service aspect that the coroner's office has about working with families of people that just lost somebody, regardless of how they do. They, they're, they're huge advocates of helping people walk through the confusion, you know, where you, a family member is found deceased in their apartment one day. And, and a beautiful thing that this office does is they, they walk people through because when a family member is hit with that, they have no idea about calling a mortuary, a funeral home, and they have no idea. But yeah. you know what? She summed it up. She said, she said one of the holiest things that she's ever heard, and, I've, and this moved me. She said, I'm here. And I was like, wow. Wow. I mean, think about that. If when you're dealing with people, and I think it's 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 applicable in leadership, is is your follower, the person that you're working with, that you're responsible for. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think a binding element is that they know and trust simply, I'm here. Yeah, it which that, yeah, it's servant leadership, right? And when yeah, she said that and she went down my spine. And and I was like, two simple words, and uh, and that's it. So yeah, you're right. Uh, and this happens not just in policing, but there are companies all over the world that chase away the most talented, creative people who can be walking around, Erwin, with that next Facebook, with that next Twitter, that next line of code that, that yeah. would change their dynamics and throw everything in. And, but if they're in an environment where everything is suppressed and creativity has been shut down and, and for sure you're not allowed to talk, right? Because you're, you're meaningless to people. Then, um, you know, it's kind of scary to think, think what opportunities walked out the door with an individual uh, yeah. millions of times over and yeah. over, over history. Yeah. Kind of scary. It reminded me of a little quote I saw. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a real quote, but I really truly like this conversation it was between the CFO and the CEO where mm -hmm. the CFO uh, asked the, the, the CEO, you know, what if we train our people and they leave the company? And the CEO responded, what if you don't train them and they stay? Yeah, <laughs> there's, you know, okay, yeah, but there's a balance. I mean, we don't live in a world of absolutes. I think we live in a world right now where people believe everything's absolute, which is why we're not getting along so well. But <laughs> yeah. there, there's a balance in that too. Um, but the but but I, th I think he's right is that you know part of this whole thing is an investment in people is and people we feel when we know we're being invested in we we have a, a really good groundwork for trust right is that yeah. investment is a gift because usually what that investment starts to to entertain inferred or directly is trust autonomy uh, a, a drive for work satisfaction and, 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 and a connection of, of that service. So yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's just the idea that we train people again, ideally not to become automatons and just knock out a task. We, we train people hopefully for where we're at is what they can bring and what we're grateful for and give them the opportunity to bring. And again, the only thing that does that is leadership. Exactly. It, you know, and th they feel valued as well. If, that, if you're that, investing it, in yeah. them, you know, yes, and I always I say mean, the best investment you can make is in yourself, right? Yes, so you should yes, be, exactly. I consider myself to be the uh, eternal student. And I guess you do the same because Amen. you also learn from your students. Yes. And yes, it's wonderful. Yeah. Would, would yeah, you it, say uh, that, that great leadership is also um, a part of being a great leader is uh, being a role model? First, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think I think one one thing first of all is I think to be a great leader you have to learn to be a great follower. Is that uh, there that that there's a, a relationship in there too that that uh, people that don't follow well really are are, are going to have a hard time actually getting into leadership because you're learning the reciprocal of that and you're learning what that means too, and loyalty comes into that too. But the role model thing is super critical, and and uh, I'm I'm big on that. 
uh, when I'm in Victoria, Texas, in, in about a week and a half, and I'm talking to the class, I will get into a discussion with them. And, uh, and somewhere along the line, I always roll out these little tidbits of, by the way, when you get a command, this is a rule. And they're not the rules that are listed. You know, like a, one of the rules, the first rules of command is you go get promoted, you have a cake, you get happy. The first rule is you go and find the person that's going to take your place and, and cultivate them. Well, that's axiomatic. You're, yeah, what do you mean? I just got this. And I got, well, what the goal is, is that, that that's what a leader does, right? Is that we fill our shoes through developing the people that are coming up behind us. But one of the things I will tell them in, in that conversation is uh, I'll look around and I'll say, by the way, uh, once you get into this command thing and, and you go out, uh, you've had your last, and I'm, uh, you've had your last crappy day. And I'll go, what? And I'm like, yeah. I said, you know, the, the thing is, is just like you said, or to the role model thing is the leader is, is the weatherman. And, uh, and especially in policing right now, this is the challenge they have, and most of them come to it. When things are difficult, if the leader comes in and their head is low and they're frowning, and much worse, if they're mumbling or vocalizing their criticisms, their, their disgust and, and things like that, you're, you're the weatherman. You are setting the weather for every follower that's around you, and their tone will go right along with yours. And what I tell them is that you're not allowed to come in anymore and commiserate. And in, in this is the hard part. Even if things are not going great at home, your followers don't need to see that. Is if you come in and, and you have your head up, no matter what the adversity is, and no matter how bad it is, and you're pulling forward and instead of griping, you're hunting solutions and engaging them in solutions, you're giving them real-time permission to change their attitude and their morale. And, and that you you that's the role model thing is you need to be everything you say you are, first of all, but all of the facets of character, all of the facets of, of what leadership means to the follower. When you, when you write those on a leadership type of philosophy or anything like that, you have to walk that walk. But I love when you said the role model, because right now in policing, that's what I challenge them with. Are you coming to work every day and moving the ball up? even in horrible times, and sometimes it can be very difficult these days, are you coming to work and reminding them of their value and reminding them that this career matters and reminding them that, hey, together as a team, we can survive any of these rough times and everything. But I, I always tell them, you know what, if you're, if you're coming in bad, then this, this may not be your gig right now until you can fix that because your responsibility is – not getting the next meeting done for the boss. Your responsibility is this people that are entrusted to you is to move them uh, through their career to the best of your ability to make them enjoy that career and feel valued. I love the raw model thing. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. And, and it's more than just dressing sharp and shining your shoes. All that comes into play too, that those are the expectations, but a yeah. lot of them bypass the idea that, Hey, these people weren't assigned to me. I, well, they were. I don't like. I don't like using the words assigned or subordinate or work for or anything. I, I abhor those words. To me, in my thing, is that if I got assigned with a group of people, technically assigned, that I was entrusted, and much like having children, I'm. In, I'm there. It's a privilege to say that I've got anywhere from seven people. To when I was a, a commander and I took a patrol command, I, I would have anywhere from 110 to 130 people entrusted with me with with a cut of a paper when I went out there. You know that's an incredible privilege and responsibility. Yeah, yeah. That you're not there to make them work per se. You're there to make sure they color inside the lines and everything. They're you're responsible for their well being in that workplace. So we don't have good people walk out the door after we yeah, train sure. them. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge mindset issue for a lot of people. So, oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a conversation uh, a few months ago with another uh, entrepreneur, and he's the, the manager of, of, of the company, or actually mm -hmm. the CEO of the company. And he put it like this you know, we, he got this pyramid uh, in, in place in his company. And he said, you know, I'm at the top of the pyramid. And I'm serving my management layer that's below me. And that mm -hmm. management layer is serving the departments that they're responsible for. And the right. department leaders are serving the people on the work floor. So it's a pyramid, but it's totally the, the other side around as what you would expect it, right? You turn it on its head. Exactly. Yeah. 
And, and uh, I think that's that's a great uh, way of sharing uh, leadership. You know, you're not there to command. No. Even though your title may be commander. <laughs> right. Exactly. But you're, yeah. You're exactly. there to serve your your team members so they can excel in their positions, you know, and get the best out of them. Yes. It. And, and it's it it actually for me that if if there's anything I miss in my career, you know, it 28 years is a pretty good run, you know, and and everything. But if, there, if the, the thing I miss and I tell people all the time is those things is, um, you know, uh, the idea I remember, you know, we always talk about open door policies, which oh, yeah. are so much more deeper than being accessible. I mean, you can be accessible, but are you approachable? And if you're approachable, are you are you truly available? And are you in? Then we move into the deep levels of your actively listening and 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 are you accomplishing things? But I remember sometimes I'll I'll bring that up and people will say, "Well, I have an open door, but man, sometimes I'm real busy." And 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 by the way, I I go into deep conversations about don't become administrative when you get in leadership positions. That's just a lie you're telling yourself. But they'll talk about how well I, I let people come in, but they come in and man, sometimes they just talk. And I'm like, "What do they talk about?" Well, they just talk about fishing or this and everything. And I said, I said, "Well, don't take that for granted." Because they probably walked through four or five, past four or five offices or tons of leaders in their career that didn't feel comfortable enough to stop in and ask how you're doing and to talk about fishing. And it, in leadership, what you learn is that when they come in and they talk about casual things, which I, I was always grateful because it means that they, they trusted me enough to say hi and, and that they didn't look at me like the command thing. Uh, but, you know, I always tell them a, a man or a woman may come in. And talk about those things for a few minutes, but a lot of times they're they're testing the water one more time on casual conversation. And if you're patient and you're actively listening, they may pull that door to and bring you the thing they really need. And yeah. uh, that that's the again that uh, as I left, uh, I was a project guy in the aspect that if I was moving command assignments and. Uh, you know, a lot of people are always worried about when I move to another command, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to structure this and everything. Well, I, I'm going to make this legacy piece. Well, here's another rule of leadership, is especially in command, is that you no longer are the person that comes up with the next earth moving idea. Your only responsibility is create the environment where the ideas are going to come from, right? We're yeah. done. We're done. And, 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 and that's how people add value and feel value. But you're, you create that. But when you go into that into that thing, a lot of people would look at it as they would anoint themselves as a change agent, which is very dangerous because sometimes change doesn't need to happen. I, you know what I did, Erwin, is I've, I've made a, a, a study, a, a meditative study of all the people that, uh, that I knew that I was going to be entrusted with, whether it was a small group or a very large group. And the ones that I knew, because it was a very new, I was, I, I was like fourth in seniority when I retired, so it was a very new department. You know what I paid attention to is what I'd seen distantly with those people over the years as to how they felt about their job or whether they were motivated or not, or whether they were struggling, whether they were really to a point of circling a drain. And you know what my little list was when I went into a command it was a little list of people that I was going to do all those other things, but they became the project. They, they became the, the thing where I ran to and created a connection as fast as possible that they're their immediate report to their sergeants and lieutenants, I would meet and talk about how are they doing? What do you think's missing? And what do you think we can do to, to bring them back in? That's what I miss is uh, to me, that was the win is to, is to take that again. Cause if I, if you can improve the individual, then everything around them tends to improve. And then the force multiplier in leadership is, especially in policing is that if you are kind and, and attentive and work with a, a person that's entrusted to you, the force multiplier is, is that when they talk about you with their peers, you, you will be elevated. That trust will, will start to ebb out uh, like a pebble hitting the water because their peers will look over and say, you know, that guy or that girl must be okay because Donnie said that, that they went to him with a problem and they just resolved it. And in policing, you know what the opposite is? Is don't, under no circumstances don't don't go talk to that lieutenant or that commander. Never ever open your because of the the culture of that top down driven. I'm yeah, going to yeah. talk. You're going to listen. Um, so that that's the reward. And you know that again, these things I'm talking about are not they're not unique to law enforcement. They're in every industry in the world, every one of them. And uh, 
that that's why again the passion for me is is that you know our our job should be making about it should everything should be around making the job that people do that we're entrusted to enjoyable because they get super effective when they're happy i mean it's it's uh it's like I, I guess it would be like turning, uh, uh, taking a room and adding nitrous oxide, you know, the laughing gas is, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. is that good leadership is nitrous oxide and, and everything. It's just not dangerous. It, you can never get too much of it and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and bring and bringing them and bringing them up and always adding to them and never taking away. Those, those are the big things. So nice. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's beautiful to listen to you because you got such a, um, a calmness in your voice, such a peace. Mm-hmm that it's right. already engaging for the listener. And that's, I think that's also a part of being a great leader, you know, and knowing how to bring a message across. Yeah. It, uh, you know, it, uh, when I, when I started with, uh, FBI leader, it was right before I'd retired and went on the road several times. And, uh, the, um, the, the, the things that are, that are neat about this that speak to it is when you talk about hearing it in my voice, uh, I may, I may travel, uh, three times a month, uh, rarely four, but it, uh, and I took a few weeks off the road because, um, well, quite frankly, we've got big things happening here. My wife's birthday's coming up. You don't go on the road on your wife's birthday. There's rules. Not. <laughs> exactly. Well, if you want to live, but it, yeah. uh, uh, and I, and you know, we have a small farm here. I think I told you we have six acres and we have miniature horses and this is spring here in Kentucky and everything's growing. So I have to kind of master the landscaping and plus it's cathartic, but Here's the, I, 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 thanks for noticing that because when I started, I was concerned about the away time for my wife and how she would feel about it. And, uh, but you know, when you, when you when you have a wonderful spouse and my wife, Wendy is wonderful. Uh, we were just talking about it yesterday is, uh, I was asking her, do you want me to cut back on this? And, and she will always say, absolutely not. You love what you're doing. And you know, what a, what a cool thing for her to say is, is to, is to really know that because she knows that, uh, she can feel that passion too. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's very supportive. And, uh, when we, when we instruct with FBI leader, I think there's maybe 38 of us, I think now, which is a, a small cadre of people, but it, I don't even hardly like to use the word teach. Because we're delivering information, but that if, if, if you think that I'm excited now, come see me in Texas for five days. And, and I, I, will, I will have the switch on from 830 in the morning till four in the afternoon every day, and the energy won't fade. And, and, and the whole, you know, we actually are more uh, uh, informational, motivational speakers is I'm, I'm going to give you tools. I'm going to, you're going to walk out. I'm not just going to deliver, pump information out to you. But I'm going to take these theories and I'm going to turn them into things that you can do practically starting Monday when you go back to your assignment. And, and I'm going to give you the why. And I'm going to give you – and I'm going to feed your brain and your heart with this stuff to where, yeah, all of a sudden it's not about getting these reports done better. It's about making a person who's more capable of making the report so that they take pride in that report. And, and how to work with people that are struggling, you know. Uh, it, not people with problem or, or, or problem people, but people with problems. So yeah, it, it, it we're, you know, I remember early on, my wife was, I, I would tell her that, well, I'm going to get to bed. It'd be like nine. She goes, why are you going to bed so early? I said, I'm beat. I, 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 it's more than being on your feet. Is it everybody I work with loves these people so much that we pour everything into it. And, and, and I think that's the difference in FBI leader is they have gone through some of the driest training in their careers. You, if you've never seen dry training, uh, Irwin, come to a police in service in most cases. And uh, <laughs> the police industry has mastered the art of death by PowerPoint and in killing people <laughs> in their seats. And, and we are horrible about it, right? But, but you know, it, uh, one of the things I take a lot of pride in is, is being able to, to move people uh, – even in boring things, because, for example, I still teach, uh, volunteer teach at the Department of Criminal Justice Training here in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Next week, I will go and spend two hours in a, in a session. They have a session for new police chiefs and sheriffs, which I'm flattered to be even invited to go speak to executives in, in police departments from across the country. You know, the topic that they, they brought me on board to do was budgeting. Oh. And 
oh yes that that's it right yeah. But uh, several years ago, they reached out. The person that was doing it was was stepping aside. And one of the people I'd met, you know, these connections you make uh, are amazing. And he he said, hey, you know, and he was gentle about it because he knew this is budgeting, right? He goes, would you take a look at this? And, and you know, and my, my graduate degree is an MBA. You know, that's where I got that process love. And yeah. he's, he's, he goes, would you take a look at this? And he was kind of gentle. He goes, would you consider maybe coming down and taking a shot at this, this two hour block with new chiefs and sheriffs? And I said, absolutely. Cause I love these people. Department of criminal justice training certified me over 20 years ago as an instructor and there's groovy people. So I took the curriculum and I looked at it. And I'm like, they're killing people with this. I can tell they're killing people with this. <laughs> right. And, and, yeah. um, you know, it, what was what a, a personal challenge to me is I, I reworked it within the guidelines of what they had certified, mm -hmm. uh, developed a, a presentation instead of an instruction block. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very proud to say I knocked it out of the park. And I remember that they listened one time and they were like, oh, my, which which I'm like, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, because that's my that's my thing, man. Can I come in and can I take something dry and, and really move people with it? And when I was doing the uh, two-hour block one day, they had a student in there who had been through a bigger program they had where there's a four-hour block of budgeting, which I'm like, I don't know who this the, the, the uh, sadist was that made four hours of budgeting instead of two, but they mastered it. And they, they told me when I was done, they said that he'd leaned over and said, that's the guy you need in CJED for budgeting. And they said, would you? And I said, yes. So I expended it into four hours. And uh, uh, it, that... Uh, that's uh, that if I didn't have that passion for leadership, because the leadership passion is what takes me and makes, makes me able to deliver things that just suck. But when I'm done with them, I'm, I'm, and I'm, this, this will come off as bragging when I'm done with them. Uh, I've had some of them say that in that, like, if they're in a, a multi-week program that I was the instructor for that multi-week program that they liked the best over yeah. budgeting. So, and I'm not, and again, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but you know, your, your whole show is based on these passions that drive us into entrepreneurship and, and, and drive us uh, through life maybe. But if I didn't have that passion and care about those people, some of them I've never met, but I care about them because I know what they're doing and I know it's yeah. difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that in our community, we need them to be the best they can be. Right. Yeah, because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a consumer of law enforcement services. Now I'm no longer a deliverer. So yeah. I, I, I have in a, my family is out there somewhere always you're there. Um, so again, that, that's that, that, that passion led thing that they feel. And, uh, you know, when they leave my class, they're, they're not aces in peach tree or quicken or Excel, but, but you know what they, they are is that they have a, a real good firm ethical standing on, on how you handle large amounts of public money and uh, how you protect those coffers and, and how you build the relationships in your community so the community wants to provide more funding to that organization yeah. instead of being the opposite where it's like, mm, they suck. I don't want to give them another million dollars, <laughs> you know, that's yeah. business, right? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, I also think that you shared a very important thing that that about teaching and, and, and sharing information is you're not you're not only – telling the what to do but you're also telling the the why behind it you know you give it there, there you go and yeah. the moment they understand what the purpose is to of doing something they understand it and that they, they, they can grab onto that you know not just yes. telling you what to do but if you know why to do it and what the purpose is behind it then it clicks with them yeah, that would be like having driver's education for a young man or woman, right? And when you're talking about something simple like uh, uh, road recovery, you know, where the right tire dips off of the, the, the road for a minute and you have to recover and come back up, which which incidentally is where a lot of fatalities come from because people are oh, yeah. trained. You know, if I sat there and got them a scientific calculator and went through every bit of the physical dynamics of their motion and the direct redirection of the motion and the counter effect and everything, and I did all of that stuff, and gave them a test on the physics of what that is, that is meaningless. What, what is meaningful is to put them behind a wheel of a car in a test track and tell them to rock that wheel off that car a little bit, off that road a little bit, and how to gently and slowly pull that wheel up and recover. You're, there's the tool, right? And, and you know yeah. what? I think in a lot of instruction that we suffer, I'm going to tell you now, I think public education and schools in this country is ate up with it. 
we spend too much time trying to ingrain the philosophy in in the um, science behind things instead of the practicality. And in leadership, it's all practice. Is you know some of the research material and leaders that we have comes from very esteemed organizations and very esteemed up to date peer reviewed research. All of that's going on in the background, and they don't know that. We don't produce anything. Dr. Moore does not bring anything out that isn't timely. I mean, on the cusp, as fast as we can move it into a curriculum. And then it's our job to, to move it into teachable moments. But, you know, they've, they've been to too many classes before where somebody will get up and pontificate, you know, tuck their thumbs in and, and, and talk about this, all this theory that they know. But you know what? It, it means nothing to me if I can't go back and make an application out of it and have examples of what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. So big deal. That's it's, it's what the, it's it's what they're saying in 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 sales as well. You know, they say facts tell, stories sell. So the moment you got your facts from your teaching, you can put it in a story so people can align to the story and know why they should do something. Then it, right. it sticks with them. That's what FBI Leader does. That wow, you know, when I went on board with them and see, I get excited talking about it. Is um, we have a very good curriculum. But they give us 100% autonomy on customizing that curriculum through our experiences to make it real for these people. So when Dr. Moore delivers that, he doesn't, ex he never expects everybody to come out and he'll give you a sample slide deck to kind of show you the, the, uh, the, the, the movement of it and, and the high points and everything like that. But, but there, there's so much, we have flexibility that I don't get in other environments to be able to bring such a personalization to this thing to where it is not uncommon to have tears shed in these rooms because we, we take people on emotional trips with this thing of understanding. And yeah. uh, it's not uncommon for somebody to approach you either in an evaluation or email you later and say, uh, you know what, my home life has improved because I took what I learned that week and applied it in my home. Wow. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, this, so what, what, I, what I love about the organization is that we, we go a lot deeper, but they don't feel like we take them in the deep end of the pool, but it doesn't feel like I drug you down there. And, and that's yeah. because the people and, and again, some of the people I work with, if you've been to the website and you look at the faculty, the uh, myself, some of these people that I work with that I've got to meet are rock stars in the law enforcement industry that come from incredibly uh, incredibly challenging lifestyles for example dr uh, example dr anthony bats tony I, I remember the first time i met him for dinner when i worked with him as i said if i ask you too many questions you can stab me in the eye with your fork tony was the commissioner of the baltimore police department during the freddie gray incident and if you've tracked anything in american policing in the last decade that was a huge thing where baltimore went into days of riots and to the idea that i'm sitting at dinner with the person that was driving that boat at that time. And then he's so candid about everything that happened in that period, the, the political corruption that he dealt with, the, the woefully unpreparedness of the police department because the city, I never knew these things. The city, for example, the Baltimore police never had riot training or civil disturbance training is a better word for it. Can, can you think about this for a minute? Yeah. Because that's not always getting out and getting, getting into tussles. There's, there's an element of that that actually protects things by their presence. They never had equipment to go out and stand in an environment where people are throwing rocks and pieces of asphalt and things at you. Mind boggling. And then there's two that I work with from uh, Oakland, California. And if you ever get interested in what's going on over here, Oakland is, I, I'm, I'm not making this up, Erwin. I think has had eight or nine police chiefs in the last 10 years, which is crazy stupid. Wow, and yeah. that's, that's a government failure, right? Because if, if leadership isn't in place, getting a shot at it, then the followership is in a state of confusion all the time. So I work with two wonderful people that have experiences that far outweigh mine, but man, I soak it up like a sponge. So, you know, you work with people that they get to take those experiences that uh, quite frankly, uh, to work with somebody like Ann Kirkpatrick, Sean went or, uh, Sean, there's even a Netflix documentary on Sean went called the force if you want to, and he's a, a great guy, but you know what, to meet them and talk to them, you'd probably have to buy their book, uh, or a book if they write a book. Yeah. So what Lita does is that people spend, you know, up to a week with these people that have experiences that I, I never had and probably never would have, but Coming back to my first point is those experiences with leader, letting them take those and pour them into that curriculum. 
the curriculum's there, but it's almost not there. It, it, all the high points, everything gets hit and people are learning, but yeah. they learn because they listen to us talk about things that worked. And just as importantly, we talk about things that we tried that failed. And, yeah. and you know, that, 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 that reminds them too, that, Hey, you can stumble on this journey, right? You, you can make, yeah. you can make mistakes. You just, the, the trick is, am I moving on and moving forward? So exactly. That's yeah. the trick. I have a feeling we can talk for hours on this uh, yes, yeah, subject, exactly. uh, David. Um, mm. if, if you could share one tip or a little piece of wisdom with the audience, what would that be, uh, David? I, I think if we if we stick with the leadership thing real quick, mm -hmm. is it if uh, when if you're drawn into that, is whether you're invited into it or you're you're compelled into it, because a lot of people in leadership who have that service heart, right, are going to move into leadership is always make sure that you're, you have some things on board that am I capable of self-reflection? Uh, have I, have I learned enough about emotional intelligence to really understand me? Because you're not going to be able to work with other people until you understand you and, and to go into it from a, and, and to be this, this is a weird word for a lot of people is, to, is leadership is love. It really is. And It, it's about it's about the idea that that love should be as close to unconditional as you can get and and to remember what it feels like to follow and and the fears that are in followership are the elations in followership and to and to try to recreate those things that made you elated as a leader and to give just always th this is a hundred percent of what you can give to people to the point sometimes of unfortunately of exhaustion but If you love the people that you're entrusted to, that's that's what leadership is about. And if you keep that that heart, all the other things will just just they'll just start to come. You accept them. So that would be the advice I have anybody that wonderful. is entertaining that. Yeah, that's wonderful advice, uh, David. Yeah. So if people want to get in touch with you or get to know more about you, where can they go to? You know, I ha I have a uh, just a generic for my my company, my uh, consulting company is is maybe just my biggest thing I do is contract with FBI leader. Um, I, I can give people uh, my my email address if that's okay because that's the best way sure. and that's it's simply my it's David Lyons Lex and that's D A D A V I D L Y O N S L E X at gmail dot com. Uh, that's probably the best way. The website is David Lyons Communications. Um, it's davidcom dot com. Two M's on the com, and I have that mainly up as a structure for when I move and start doing some different things. Um, It uh, uh, can I plug a podcast real quick that is unrelated to this? Do you mind? Sure. No, yeah, no, it, of course yeah. not. Yeah, and and it, uh, it me and my wife in retirement. Uh, part of this passion bleeds into a second close passion is that uh, during my career, my favorite assignment other than the leadership role was a homicide detective. And uh, you talk about a growth place. Uh, if you ever want to come back and talk about that, that's a good one too. In retirement, me and my wife have a true crime podcast. Uh, it's called the Murder Police Podcast at murderpolicepodcast.com. It uh, it's a different murder. It's a different true crime podcast. It's take it. You're just gonna be surprised by this. It's educational. So what what what? <laughs> it's funny. I can't do anything but that. So you'll hear stories about things that tragically happen to people. We uplift the victim. We are victim advocates. But you're also gonna learn these whys on when people investigate the the reason they make decisions on those strategies and things like that. And then we have several episodes that are simply educational on how forensic pathology works or forensic science works and, and things like that. So it's a little different. And if you're, if you're a learner and you're curious about those things, those are good too. And you can always reach out to, to us through there, but again, David Lyons Lex at gmail.com. If I can ever help anybody with anything, I'd, I'd be glad to, I'll be an ear. It, just like I said, is, I'm here. And that's a perfect ending of a wonderful episode. Uh, oh, thank, thank you, thank David, you. for your time and being my guest. And if you want to connect with this wonderful man, you got his details and please do reach out to him. Uh, I think he has a lot more to share with you.